Welcome to your favorite show, Let's Speak English. Hi, welcome to your favorite TV show, it's Let's Speak English TV show, brought to you by Royal International Institute, Kasi, Royal HD TV. And on today's show, we're going to talk about something very interesting. I have a foreigner with me who's lived in Mongolia for some time now, and on this show, we're going to talk about life in Mongolia as a foreigner, and he's going to give you some tips on how to make good career choices. Today with me in the studio is Michael Blake. Thank you very much, Mr. Blake. Oh, well, thank you, show. Sure. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to have you on my show. Actually, I've had lots of people, different calibers, different colors, and from different races. And today I have an American, right? From America? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's my pleasure to have you on my show. So I brought you on this show for one reason. Uh, I kind of realized you've been in Mongolia for some time and you're a foreigner. So I want the Mongolians to kind of feel what it's like to have a foreigner in the country. So what is life like in Mongolia for you? Uh, well, I've only been here about six months, uh, so I'm still relatively new. Uh, but it's it's exciting. It's a developing country. It's uh, the, the biggest thing that you have to acclimate to would be the climate, that's for sure. It can be winter in the morning, summer in the afternoon, and then winter again at night. So that's the biggest. Also the food. There's some food differences that uh, are quite uh, astonishing. It definitely throws you out. In the States, we don't eat some of the animals that they eat here. They're definitely a meat-eating society here. So uh, there's, some, there's some things you have to acclimate to, for sure. And it was like what? Uh, well, at first glance, I've never eaten camel until I came here. That was a new experience. Uh, not towards my taste, but uh, in the States, we're, we're limited to livestock of, like, cows, chickens, and pigs. We don't run out of, like, towards horses or camels or even actually sheep or goat. We, we don't really consume a lot of in the States. So that's, that's all a very new experience for most foreigners who are coming from a from a southeast area of the United States because that's just something we don't really eat a lot of. So how did you feel the first time you ate camel? Uh, it was interesting, uh, to say the least. Uh, actually, it kind of upset my stomach. Some of the food here, as a foreigner, you have to learn. Uh, it's not always pasteurized. Uh, so when you eat some things, it can upset your stomach because you're just not used to it. You're not acclimated to some of the natural enzymes that are in some of these foods that they eat. Whereas we eat a lot more processed food, I suppose, in the States. So when it goes towards the dairy products that they produce in this country, I, I find that a lot of it can upset my stomach just because it's not pasteurized and stuff. But as towards the meats, you can kind of get, you can get used to it. Uh, some of, I have my favorites and my non-favorites. Okay, so uh, what are your favorites? I, well, I enjoy the beef. I, I enjoy the Mongolian beef. It's nice. Uh, I don't really care for some of the uh, other exotic animals like camel or even horse. Uh, I've eaten horse before in other countries, but I've never eaten it where it's so prevalent and, and it's such a base of their diet. In other countries, it's more of like a, an exotic food, whereas here it's, it's a staple in some of their diets. So that's, that's pretty new to me as well. Okay, so what are your non favorites uh, definitely my non-favorite. I, I don't prefer goat. It's it's something that I, maybe it's an acquired taste that over time you develop. I, I just never developed the taste for goat. Uh, also, some of the mutton uh, can be really, I don't want to say gamey, but uh, just texturally and also the fattiness, whereas I understand the fat and content in some of the meat here because it is a harsh climate. But uh, coming from a, uh, a more... Uh, I guess lean, uh, when we eat our proteins overseas, it's much more lean because we don't usually eat the fat content, especially where I'm from, uh, because we just don't have the harsh climate that's here that's needed to consume, you know, for energy and everything. So that's something that's very different from what I'm used to. So why did you choose Mongolia in the first place? Uh, well, uh, I have been teaching overseas for about seven years now. Uh, mm -hmm. I chose Mongolia because of my wife. Uh, we moved here to be closer to her family. Okay. Uh, I, other than that, th there was not really a choice that I could actually make because of she runs the household. So we decided, or she decided, that this would be a good acclimation for me to be in. Also, it's been really great. Uh, it's a developing country, so I'm being in my background in economics, it's pretty fascinating. A lot of the, uh, not only just the policies that are changing, but the laws that are changing so rapidly here because everything is very rapid. Okay. So you're married to a woman? 
Yes, yes. Uh, I've been married now for quite a few years, uh, going on almost four. Uh, we don't have any children yet. Uh, we met when I was overseas in Korea. I was teaching and she was attending the university that I was lecturing at. And uh, we just hit it off. And from then, uh, we got married a few, actually about eight months later, we ended up married and have been happy ever since. So you married a student? Uh, she was actually <laughs> my student, uh, and she was actually in the doctorate program there too, so she, it wasn't like she was young. She's only two years younger than me. Uh, but actually, one of her friends was one of my students, and I, when she was always in my office for help, and we just started talking because she was around a lot because those two were together. Oh, okay. She was always in your office for help? Uh, her friend was always in my office for help, but those two were always together so because they were in a foreign country, so two Mongolians kind of stuck together when it came oh, to... Oh, poor friend. Yeah. The friend was coming to the office, but she wasn't the catch. Her friend was the catch. Yeah, for me. Her friend, I believe, I believe her friend was actually already taken, so... Oh, okay. So, what was your first impression about Mongolia? Uh, my first impression was dust. Um, I came in April, so it was rather dusty. And I've never been in, because I never lived in an arid climate like this, so I'm not used to so much dust. Um, and it really affected my allergies and things like that. Uh, that was my first notice, uh, just the dust. And that, I don't want to sound like it's dirty, but it's just because of the arid climate, there's a lot of dust in the air, and it just gets in my contacts, and it gets in, my, in all of my nasal sure passage and everything. Okay. So the dust was a first impression? Yeah, my first impression was, yeah, it was very dusty, and it made it difficult at first for me. Uh, other than that, it was very hospitable people. Uh, I found it fascinating, the gurs, the, like a tent, very nomadic. Uh, from my culture side, we're non-nomadic, so it's, it's very night and day difference. Uh, also, some of the pretty clothing. I, I really like their traditional clothing. It, it's, not only is it beautiful, but it's also very functional. In a lot of societies, when I see their traditional clothing, like when I was in Korea or Japan, uh, it was not as functional. It was more in like you would use it for a, a specific holiday or for a specific wedding or something. But whereas here, it's it's such a gorgeous ga gowns and like wardrobe that they wear, very colorful. But it's used for everyday use, so it's still it's still being used. It's not just like a ceremonial gown that's hung on the wall. Okay. And what was your first impression about Mohammed? Um. It was hit and miss. Uh, they're more of aggressive than I'm used to in a lot of Asian culture, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, coming from a more docile culture, uh, like in Japan or Korea, it's more docile. Whereas in Mongolia, it's more, I don't want to use confrontational, but it's more objective. They're, they have no problem asking questions or, or you know, getting the answers back. Um, they're, they're very polite. Uh, I, I've not had a whole lot of situations with that. Um, and also, it's still a developing country, so there's a, a lot of mindsets that are just are changing. So there's, they're still apprehensive when it comes to some things, but they're, they're opening up quickly. Okay. And um, what about the weather? How did you adapt to the harsh Mongolian weather? Because you said the weather is kind of... Yeah, I, so I'm, how do you adapt to well, I'm still adapting. <laughs> it's not as easy as I thought it would be. Uh, when I first got here, it was cold to me already, and it was April, and that was the springtime. Uh, winter, everybody kept saying, well, winter comes, just wait, wait. When winter comes, you'll see. And now it's starting to come, and I can see that it's, it's very harsh. I've never lived in a, uh, a sub-zero climate before until here, so it's... And actually, I've only recently seen snow within a few years, because where my hometown is from, there's no snow. Wait. So, sorry. Hmm. This would be your first winter in Mongolia. Yeah, this will be my first winter in Mongolia. I'm sorry for you. I know, that's, and that's the response I get from everybody. So, have you got your winter jackets and everything? Are you ready for uh, it? My wife has done very well, and we, we've we've accumulated some winter stuff that I've gotten. I, there's a few pieces I still need to get, but I, I think I'm I'm pretty good right now. Okay. 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 Um, I'm going to talk about Mongolian celebrations. Mm. Have you been to any of the Mongolian celebrations since you came to this country? Yes, yes. I, I was here for Natam uh, in July, so I got to see some of the games that they do. It was a, a very uh, festive event with a lot of archery and horse racing. Uh, I got to taste a lot of their food. Uh, Hosher at that time was really was really pushed. I, I mean, that push was also celebrated, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to eat a lot of Hosher, and uh, it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. We got to to watch wrestling, which in Mongolia is like their NBA basketball. So it was really exciting to see how 
how passionate a lot of Mongolians are about that. And it was interesting. I also was able to attend a wedding. Uh, I do have in-laws here now, okay. so I recently, within the past month, had got to uh, see a, a, a traditional Mongolian wedding, which was really very, very unique. It was very nice. Okay. What part of America do you come from? Uh, I'm from the southeast. I was born in Florida, South Florida. Uh, most people would know my, my hometown is actually Cocoa Beach. Um, I'm north of Miami, so I'm in that suburbs, uh, southern tropical area. So I you say no snow? In yeah, there's no snow. Uh, well, maybe in the northern parts there might be, but not really. Uh, where I'm from, it's pretty warm year-round. Yeah. I think the viewers will be so surprised that there is a place in America that has no snow. Oh yeah, there's a few places in America that have no snow. Uh, southern California doesn't really snow. San Diego area. Um, I think some of the southern Texas parts also wouldn't snow. Um, but yeah, anywhere from central to south Florida, there's no snow at all. So. I'm going to shift a little bit mm -hmm. to Florida. Mm -hmm. What's life like in Florida? Uh, more active. Um, I notice in Mongolia when the winter's coming, everything starts to slow down because it's, mm -hmm. it's just not comfortable to be outside. Whereas I come from a, a tropical setting where it's year-round, it's always hot. So it's always active. And there's a lot of activities to do, especially with me being right on the ocean. A lot of surfing, a lot of fishing. Also, our diets are a lot different. I grew up on a, a heavy seafood diet. Okay. Whereas Mongolians really are not appealing, they, they don't appeal to seafood at all. Seafood. Yeah, because of, they're in a landlocked country. So. so, do you have any interesting festival in Florida you would like to talk about? Um, well, yeah, there's, uh, there's a couple different kind of festivals that they have. There's uh, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo is actually celebrated pretty heavily in my hometown. It's where they have a lot of costumes and they actually celebrate the dead is what this considered. And uh, it's going to be where you put on costumes and you do a lot of partying and just remember, it's kind of to remind yourself of the people that you've lost in your past and to celebrate life. And that's, that was a, a nice one. There's also a, a few other Florida festivals in the southern parts um, that have to do with parades and things. It's, it's towards like a Mardi Gras, which would be a part more of a, a, a more recognized uh, party, Mardi Gras over in New Orleans. We have the same thing in Florida, in the South Florida. But it's not as worldwide known yet. <laughs> okay. Studying in Florida, what is it like? Like to get into university? Is it um is well, it difficult? It's kind of diff it's I don't want to say kind of difficult. There's plenty of opportunity. And that's the wonderful thing about the the US is there's always opportunity for you either through scholarships, through grants, or through student loans that allow you to attend universities. Uh, Florida is wonderful in the sense that we have four really, really huge recognized universities. Um, I was fortunate enough to get into Florida State University. Uh, it took a lot of work at first. Uh, there was a lot of tests to get in. You have to take the SAT and the ACTs and everything. And then upon that, you have to write an actual letter that says why you should choose me as a student. And uh, it, it's, it sounds you know, monumental at first to get in, but actually if you do the steps, and they can help you with the steps, uh, you can obtain a, a, a very nice college degree, a very good university degree. Uh, pretty easily if you just put the effort in. So like how much are we talking about here? Like tuition fee? Uh, it's expensive. Um, my undergraduate uh, was about forty thousand dollars I would say. Um, a lot of that is that's just direct cost. Uh, I don't remember, this has been many years, embarrassing enough, uh, <laughs> since I graduated from undergraduate, but um, you pay the tuition fee, and you pay per base hour, plus books and everything, and they usually tell you for a state university like that, um, you're going to pay anywhere between 38000 and 55000 depending on what degree you get. Obviously, some degrees that you obtain are going to be less expensive, and it doesn't mean they're a less degree, it just means that maybe you need less material, less lab time, less things like that. Uh, if you do some of the heavier, like engineering, economics, like I did, you're going to usually have to take more than four years even, and you're going to have to have a lot more lab fees, so you'll accumulate a lot more costs. So, do you have like an um, opportunity for students to get scholarships or grants? Or oh, yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, within your own field, there'll be a lot of opportunity through companies who give grant money and things like that. All you have to do is submit letters. You also have to have the grades. That's a big part also, is you can't just skate through high school and then expect to attend some of these universities. You really have to put in the effort and work. And I always tell students, math is a good one. If The more effort you put into math, the easier it will get when you get into your later education, especially. Um, 
Yeah, but there's a lot of grants, a lot of scholarships that are offered to a lot of students who have a higher level GPA and are articulate when it comes to papers, when you write, you know, why they should give you money, basically. And, and you can obtain a lot of... There's also scholarships through sports and things like that. If you're an athlete, you know, there's, there's opportunity for that. Maybe you're not as strong in the academic side, but you're strong in the athleticism. And yeah, there's opportunities for that as well. Okay, talking about math, I'll come back to it in mm -hmm. the next segment. But um, do you think Mongolian students stand an opportunity to study in Florida? Uh, yeah, there's, there's no discrimination towards what countries or anything. There's international students from abroad everywhere in Florida. Uh, we have a lot of abroad country, or, uh, companies, excuse me. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest uh, who hires from abroad is Disney, who is, Disney World is definitely a huge opportunity for especially students abroad where they can work and go to school at the same time. And Disney offers wonderful scholarships for abroad students, for international, because Disney hires a lot of international uh, students, uh, individuals, it's not just students. So there's a, there's a good opportunity for it. There's also larger companies like a lot of the airline companies, and there's a lot of language needed, uh, because it, America has a, a multitude of languages. So just in the language alone, if you learn one or two languages, there's a lot of opportunity in just that, along from just learning you know, your basic math and, and sciences. Thank you very much, Mike Blake, for being with me in the studio today. Guys, I'll be right back after the short break. Stay with me and Mike Blake. We will come back again to talk about career path and how to make good choices in your career. It's Let's Speak English TV show brought to you live from Royal KK TV. Stay tuned. European Business Assembly in Odolsin Shidig Bagul Gorumjlid Mongolian Royal Academy Hamtran Hujulj Bain You're welcome back to the show Still in studio with me is Mike Blake Oh uh, Mike I'm going to shift a little bit to the career path. Mm -hmm. But first of all, I want to ask you some short questions about the uh, Mongolian system of education. You said you've taught in Korea and you've taught in Japan. Mm -hmm. So how can you compare this system of education to Mongolian system of education? Uh, I really feel the education system here in Mongolia is still in its infant stage. Uh, it's developing, and it's developing rapidly. Because they know, uh, Mongolians realize, that education is a very important thing in this whole world. Uh, so it's, it's different, it's hard to compare with, this, uh, with a country who has it developed for many, many, many years, whereas we're in an infant stage still at this one. Um, and, and just direct comparison, they know that it's important. Uh, Korea has started, they have a head start, and that's the difference, and so does Japan. Uh, whereas Mongolia is catching up, and that's that's the biggest thing. Um, as in for academics-wise, they're very similar. Uh, they they really push you know international language of English. They they push you know the math and the science, which is really important when it comes to going abroad or something like that. Uh, those are both really strong uh, degree backgrounds for for you know your career and your future. And how can you compare students like Mongolian uh, students? Students in Korea are. There's the good and the bad. They, I, I feel they're overworked in Korea. Uh, they go to school from like 7 in the morning to 11 at night. And most of them live. So the schools are like a boarding school where they actually have to, to live there and they live and breathe and study for six days a week, 12 to 15 hours a day. Wow. So it really pushes them. Um, here in Mongolia, I think they realize that it's more about the quality and not the quantity. And that's what it, a lot of these other Asian countries are still not grasping is you can study for four hours and get just as much as you can in 12 hours because the quality needs to be there, not so much the quantity. If I just throw a lot of stuff at you, it doesn't get, do anything. But if I throw good quality stuff at you, you can grasp it faster. Okay. Now, um, you talked about mathematics in the first segment. Mm -hmm. So I guess because you're an economist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if someone wants to choose a career path like you, what would you advise such a student to concentrate on? What should be his focus? Well, if you want to specifically do economics, uh, you're going to have to do math. If you don't like math, then you don't do economics. It comes down to that. Uh, you're going to have to do a lot of, you're going to do everything from your calculus base uh, to a lot of arithmetic. You're going to have to really do 
a lot of formula-based problems. Uh, that's for like active economists who, if you want to do an active sector of economy, if you want to teach, then uh, you can actually cut back a little bit on the math side of it and then go more towards um, the actual communication aspect of it and then some more of the theory base instead of the actual participating with economics. Um, besides that, of course, English is, if you really want to go abroad, English is what would be the next biggest thing for you to have is English besides math. Uh, if you do choose economics, it's a wonderful career path. There's a lot of opportunity, especially abroad. Uh, a lot of countries um, would, would love to have international economics, you know, not only teachers, but uh, actual consultants. Uh, it's, it gives them a good background. It's a good mix. So as an economist, mm -hmm. where can you work? Like Places. Oh, from anything. Uh, it depends on your education level. With the undergraduate in economics, which is a four-year base degree, uh, your bachelor's degree, uh, you can start in an entry-level position and you could do anything from working at, which sounds weird, is uh, a lot of stores, a lot of uh, like grocery stores or a lot of state department stores, especially if you have to forecast, which means you have to, dec you have to decide how much is needed for certain times of the year. So you have to forecast. And that's what economics do, or economists do, is they forecast. So you have to decide what kind of goods are going to be needed. And so for example, like at Christmas, obviously certain things are going to be more required at Christmas. So you have to forecast that and you have to have a, an idea of, of the quantity that's needed so that your store can always have it so that you can make money. Um, as you go up in education, like if you get your graduate level, then you can do some teaching. Then you can get into more of the banking side of it. Maybe you can do into the stocks and bonds and things like that. And then if you go anything higher than that, then you're just going to pretty much limit yourself to teaching. <laughs> okay. So, uh, apart from teaching, mm -hmm. have you ever worked as an economist? Somewhere? Yes, yes. My first job actually out was for Northrop Grumman, which is an airline company. Okay. Uh, I did uh, a lot of formula base for hiring. Um, what I did is they, they would bid on a project. So let's say that they would try to make so many airplanes for an airline company or something. And the North of Grumman hires on a temporary basis. So per project, they would hire this many people because they cannot afford to just have this kind of staff all the time. So they would hire for, for six months, eight months, two years even. It depended on the contract that they got. So my, my job was to actually to process numbers and figure out how many people that they needed and what was the, the best ratio of workers compared to output. Okay, sorry, yes. don't get me wrong. For me, I kind of think economics is something boring. And I know some students think that way. Oh, absolutely. Is there any way you can try to change your mindset? Uh, it can be. It, yeah, I, I went to school with a good friend of mine and I... He works at a zoo, and what he does is he actually forecasts actual food for the animals. So he's, he works in a zoo, and he makes a very good living. And all he does is he's kind of like a purchasing, where he purchases food and quantities, and he has to decide what, what's the good ratio of, of food per animal that will make them happy. So it's kind of, you can do some economics for something as easy as the zoo. So yeah, it can be fun. It can be boring, too. It depends on what you enjoy. Uh, some people enjoy performing arts, and some people like sciences. Myself, I, I don't like chemistry. I think it's very boring. <laughs> okay, um, studying economics in school can also be boring. It can be, absolutely. Is there any way you could make it to be a little bit more interesting? Uh, you try to, you try to uh, bring in things or ideas or uh, like tangible objects that people would recognize. Uh, anywhere from if you're teaching from a class of 21 to 20 year old students, then you'd like to bring in something that they would recognize, maybe alcohol for example, okay. because that's something they're experiencing now. So it gets a good laugh out of the class that you know, you're talking about vodka instead of just talking about something else. So yeah, you can bring in something that they actually recognize and you can show that there is you know, a loss and a gain with prices and differentials and then they'll understand because the object you're talking about, maybe they can relate to some. So you're trying to say it can be boring, it can be interesting. It, yes, it depends on your teacher, I suppose. But uh, I find it fascinating. But it also depends on you, if you like it. it you know, some people can, I t start talking for five minutes and boom, you're asleep. So okay. it's fine. Okay, sorry for pushing you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Apart from working in a zoo as an economist, mm -hmm. is there some other interesting job I could do as an economist? Uh, yeah, policy. I, I think this is the most interesting to me, is writing policy. Every politician who works in any form of government have economists, and you work with them in writing policies. 
And that can be really exciting, especially if you want to try to make a change. A lot of people out there that want to make changes with governments, and they feel that it's through policy. And through policy, it is through economy, or economics. So economists have a big input when it comes to policies. So every time you see like the new president of America or something, you see Obama, and all these, he has so many cabinet members, almost 80% of those are all economists. And they have different views on what policy should be written as because it affects, every policy affects people. And sometimes it's financially and sometimes not. But you as an economist, you have to project what these, uh, what these factors affect people. So yeah, you could do anything from policy to working at a zoo. There's, there's a lot of opportunity. Okay, sorry. Some of my viewers don't really understand what writing policy really means. Can you break it down? Oh, okay. It was an entail writing policy. Well, I've never actually physically done it myself. I think after teaching, I would love to get into it. But it's like if, for example, right now the big hot topic in America is Obamacare, is what it's called. It's the free health care that they're supplying. Well, for President Obama to come up with this, he had to talk to all of his advisors. And these advisors, most of them are economists, had to project what this would impact our economy, how this would impact our economy. So this bill that gives Americans health care, it impacts us by our GDP and it impacts us by our growth, everything like that. And this is what economists will do. They will calculate all these formulas out and say, if we do this, this is what will happen. And this is what we give to the President of the United States. And the President says, all right, we'll make a decision off of all these advisors, so that, and then we can make a policy. This policy could be anything from health care to immigration to food stamps, anything like this. These are all projected by economists on how it affects our growth. Okay. So being an economist can also give me the opportunity to work for a president. Oh, I, well, yeah, if you're very good. <laughs> uh, most people start at a lower level. I mean, there's... The lowest level, as a, such as a mayor who, you know, has a city, he has economists. I mean, so you you wouldn't probably come out of school and work for the president right away. But yeah, there's opportunity for always that. You could also go the private side. That's more of a public sector. You go to the private side, and then you can go for these large banks like ING and things. They're international trading, and they need economists too because they buy and sell money. And your per, your whole thing is to forecast how much there there's a gain and a loss for all this. So you can work for large companies as in the private sector, banking. You can work for public sector as in politics. Uh, you can work for you know private things such as where is the zoo or even Disney World. Disney World would need econ economists and everything. So there's a, there's a good opportunity if you enjoy doing some math-based formulas, then yeah, there's always opportunity. So is there any difference teaching economics in Japan, Korea, and Mongolia? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, usually it's the math level, the level of the students in math. Not their English level or anything like that, but just the level in math. Okay. Uh, when, you, when you move around to different schools, you'll find that maybe when they attended high school, their high school pushed them towards language or pushed them towards science, or pushed them towards math. So as walking as a teacher, you can instantly tell if these students were pushed towards the math because you, need, you do need a strong math background to start in economics. So you think Mongolian students have a very strong math background? Uh, some. Some don't. They're still learning. But I'll tell you one thing is if I do teach them some of the math to get them up, they learn real quick. Compared to other students you've taught before? Yeah, for other subjects. Uh, I've, well, I've taught some English before too, obviously. Uh, it's, really? Yeah, I, 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 I have a TEFL as well, so I did a little really? bit of teaching English. It was, it was enjoyable too. It was enjoyable too. What are you teaching English? Uh, I, I taught English in Korea for a while too, usually as a part time job for, in, for and, income. And how was it? Uh, it was nice. It was nice. It's a, there's a lot of opportunity for professors in Korea and Japan right now for English speaking native speakers. There's a lot of opportunity. Hmm. If that's the field that you enjoy. <laughs> okay, it was so interesting having you. I have one more last question for you. Mm. Do you feel homesick sometimes? Yeah, at times, of course. At times, when I turn on the television and I watch some TV and I'll see, oh, look, there's my hometown. Or, oh, look at that food. That's what I used to eat. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel homesick at times. When was the last time you went home? Uh, it's been a few years. It's been a few years. Uh, I would say four, four years. And so. when you wish to go home? I don't know. Uh, it depends. It depends on my wife when she's ready to move around. Don't no worry, she'll hear us tell me. <laughs> okay. Good having you. Thank you very much for yes, coming to the show. And if you've been watching this Let's Speak English TV show, brought to you by Royal International Institute, Costi, Royal HD TV. I'll be here again next week with something cool to blow your mind. Remember, I'm always here to blow your mind and give you something substantial. Stay with me, same station, same studio, next week. See you. Thanks for watching. 
See you soon. Same station, same time, same place.